let's talk about single slit interference. Now, if I were you, I'd already be upset and a little mad. Single slit interference, interference, wave interference is by definition multiple waves overlapping at a single point. So how could a single slit ever produce multiple waves that could overlap? I mean, when we had a double slit, if I put a barrier in here and we have a double slit, at least then, okay, I send in my wave, it gets over to here. There's a small hole. We know what waves do at a small hole. They diffract, which is to say they spread out. At least with a double slit, you would have two waves spreading out. Now they can overlap interference. But for a single slit, how are we ever going to get this? Well, I never really told you why. Why do the waves spread out at a hole? Why does diffraction happen at all? Why when waves encounter a hole do they spread out? And the answer to this question is the key to single slit interference. And the, the answer to why they spread out at a hole is something called Huygens principle. And I can't say it. This is a Dutch physicist, scientist who figured this out. Huygens principle. And I apologize right now to all the Dutch people out there. I'm butchering this name. Huygens principle, easier to spell than to say. What he said, he figured out something ingenious. He figured out this, if you've got a wave coming in with these wave fronts, remember these wave fronts are like peaks and in between them are the troughs or the valleys. If you've got a wave front coming in propagating this way, you could say, yeah, that wave front moves from here to there. That's what it does. Or he realized with a wave, you could treat every point on this wave as a source of another wave that spreads out spherically if in the forwards direction. This wave spreads out spherically, this point here. He said that a wave front you can think of as an infinite source of waves. Each point is the source of another wave and you're thinking this is horribly complicated. What? What kind of mess is this going to give you? Well, if you add this up, these are going to interfere with each other constructive, destructive, in a way that just gives you this same wave front right back. This is crazy, but true. If you let every point on this wave be another wave source, it will just add up to another wave front here. You'll just get the same thing back. And this is the key to understanding why diffraction happens, is because the wave spread, the wave was already diffracting, so to speak. It was already doing diffraction. Every point on here was doing diffraction, it's just it always added up with the other waves around it at every other point and gave you the same wave back. But when there's a barrier, when there's something in the way, these here can't rejoin up with their buddies. You just get this one here spreading out and then this one down here spreads out. All the rest of these get blocked. Now that these are blocked, they're not going to get to interfere constructively and destructively with these points here. And so what do you see when it hits the hole? You just see this thing spreading out. So it was always diffracting, so to speak. We just didn't notice it because it always added up. When you've got a hole or a barrier, that's when we actually notice it. And this is the key to single slit interference because if I get rid of all of that, if we imagine our wave coming in here like this, well, this wave's going to hit here. Every point is the source of another wave, so this point's going to start spreading out, this point's going to start spreading out. When we have a single slit, we really have infinitely many sources of waves here, and since some of them are blocked, we could see an interference pattern over here on the wall because these can interact and interfere with each other. What interference pattern are we going to see? Well, on the wall over here, we see a big old bright spot right in the middle. And if I were guessing, I would have thought that was it. Big old bright spot because you shine a light through a small hole, single hole, you'll get a big bright spot there. The weird thing is this jumps back up, goes to a minimum, a zero point, and then it jumps back up, and then it comes back up again, and you get this. These are going to be not very pronounced. These aren't very pronounced. You get a big bright spot in the middle. These are relatively weak compared to other interference patterns that we've looked at. And down here, jumps up a little bit again over and over here. So this is the pattern you see. How can we get this? How do we analyze it? That's what we're going to try to figure out. To figure that out, okay, well this is a, I said there's infinitely many sources here with when this wave gets to here. That would take a long time to draw. I'm going to draw eight. So let's say there's one, two, eight sources. Let's just imagine there's eight here. It's 
make this a little bit easier to think about. And the weird part is that this jumps back up here. So let's look at this minimum right here. Let's look at this point where it goes to zero, this destructive point. So the wave from this topmost point, this wave from the topmost uppermost point has to travel a certain distance to get there. I'm gonna also look at the fifth one down, this one that's basically halfway. How about these two? If these two interfere destructively, the argument I'm gonna make is if these two interfere destructively, all the rest of them are gonna to have to interfere destructively. Why? Well, we know how to play this game. Let's draw our right angle line here. There we go. And so we know that, okay, if these are gonna interfere destructively, this is the extra path length. This extra path length that this second wave, this lower middle wave has to travel, has to be what? If I want destructive over here, it's gotta be a half wavelength three halves wavelength, five halves wavelength. That's how much it's gotta be in order to be destructive. So if this is the first point, let's just say that's uh, one half of a wavelength. And what's the relationship between the angle that this is at on the wall compared to the center line? Well, we already figured that out. Remember, that relationship was D sine theta equals the path length difference between these. That we derived the screen had to be very far away compared to the width of the hole, um, but that, that relationship still applies. What would D be in this case? Now we have to be pretty careful. We have to be careful because this hole has a certain width. We'll call that width W. So if this hole has a certain width W, how far apart are these? These are not W apart. These are W over 2 apart. And so what's the relationship here for the path length difference between these two? Well, if they're W over two apart, I'd have D sine theta as the path length difference. So D would be W over two times sine of the angle that this makes to this point on the wall. And if their path length difference is lambda over two, then that would be destructive. So equals lambda over two. And this is a little weird already because look, I can cancel off the twos and what do I get? I get that W, the width of the entire width of the slit, times sine of theta equals lambda. This is giving me destructive. Remember before, all the points that were integer wavelengths were giving me constructive. This time it's giving me a destructive point over here. And the reason is we played this game where W is the whole width. These are only W over two apart. That two cancels with that two. Okay, but I haven't really proved that this whole, that they should all be destructive yet. This is just for these two. We've got infinitely many more in here. How are we ever gonna show that if these two cancel, the rest of them cancel? Well, we'll just pair them off. Look at this. Now imagine you come down one. I go to this one, I consider this wave that makes it over to here and the next wave down from this other one here. So I move this one down a smidgen, I move this one down a smidgen, and I imagine these two waves traveling a certain distance to get over to this point. What relationship holds between these two? I can do the same thing. These are also W over two apart. So this here is also W over two. So I'd get the same relationship, I'd get W over two, Sine of, is that gonna be the same angle? Yeah, it's the same angle, same point on the wall. And this is really far away, so these approximations are whole where these lines are supposed to be approximately parallel because this screen or this wall's very far away compared to the width. That equals, well, that's gonna be the same thing. I got W over two times sine of the same angle. Shoot, that's gotta equal the same thing that it did up here. If the angle's the same, my W over two is the same, that's also gonna equal half a wavelength. That's also going to be destructive. These two will also interfere destructively, and I can keep playing this game. I can pick this point here, over to here, and the next one down. These two would have to be destructive. I can pair them off and keep pairing them off. I'd get destructive for all of them. I could annihilate all of them by pairing them off and finding a partner that's destructive to that one. And so, this really is a destructive point. This point over here, all the light is gone, completely annihilated gives you destructive. So the short of it is that this relationship here, this relationship that W 
the slit width times sine of theta, the angle, same angle we've always been defining it as, equals integer wavelengths. This time, got to be careful though, this time this gives you destructive points, not the constructive points. It was always constructive before. This gives you destructive points now. And you might be upset. You might say, hold on a minute. We only proved this for, this was just for n equals 1 or m equals 1 one wavelength. We didn't prove this for anything besides m equals one. Well, you can just as easily show that three lambda over two would also give destructive, or five lambda over two, that would give us all the odd integers here. So m, m here can be, it can't be zero. We'll talk about that in a minute. It could be one, two, three, four, five, and so on. One we already showed. Three, you get, well, if you made this three halves wavelength, that's also destructive, that'd be three. Five halves wavelength, the twos are always canceling. So five halves wavelength would work. What about the even integers? How do we get these? Well, those come from the fact that I didn't have to pair these off with the top one and the middle one. That's dividing this into w over two. So pairing them off by lengths of w over two I can pair them off, I could divide this by any even integer. I could imagine pairing off, instead of doing the topmost one and the middle one, I could do the topmost one and skip one down here. And so I can pair these off. If I divide this into this distance right here, that distance would be what? That'd be w over four. And so I can imagine pairing off, okay, if these two cancel, if those two points cancel, then the next one down, so this one here and this one here would also cancel by the same reasoning. And so I can play the same game now, but w over four would be how I divide it. I can't divide it by anything. I can't divide it by three or like 2.5 because I always want to pair these off in twos, always twos. That's my whole plan. That's my whole strategy here is to cancel these in twos. And I can do that by dividing this by any even integer. So w over four would work. What would that give us? Okay, w over four is the distance between these times sine theta equals, let's just say it's the first one, half of a wavelength. Well, if I solve this, if I move the four over, I get w sine theta equals two lambda. So the twos also give us destructive interference. I could divide by eight, that would give us four. Once I move it over, I can divide by any even integer. Any integer here is gonna give us destructive points on the wall. So this would be m equals one. This would be m equals two, and so on upwards. So this relationship right here gives you all the destructive points. How come m equals zero is not a destructive point? Well, m equals zero is right in the middle. That's the most constructive point. That's the brightest spot. So m equals zero is not a destructive point, but any other integer does give you a destructive point. So this is the formula for the destructive points. W is the entire width of the single slit. Theta is the angle, the way we normally measure angle here. You imagine a center line like that. Imagine a line up to your point on the wall. This angle here would be theta. And m is any integer that's not zero Lambda is the wavelength of the actual light that you're sending in here. Now, this just gives you the destructive points. You might wonder, hey, I'm clever. If the integers are giving us destructive points, then the half integers should give us the constructive points if w sine theta equals, you know, lambda over two or three lambda over two. Is this going to give us constructive points and Eh, not really. So there's some complications here. And if you're interested in why this does not give the constructive points, I'm gonna make another video. Watch that one, because if you've been paying close attention, you should be upset about something else too. You should be upset about something earlier I've said. Might make it seem like we can prove this does not happen. With the diffraction grading, if you were paying close attention, we proved, quote unquote, that these do not occur. And if you're upset by any of that, or you want to know why the constructive formula does not exactly give you constructive points, uh, watch that video. 
If you're happy with what we do know, that this gives you the destructive points on the wall, then you're good.